Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction and thank you everybody for uh, joining. I'm just going to start sharing my screen so that we can kick things off. Let me do that there. So can I check? Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Perfect. Excellent. Well, I shall wish you all a good morning from uh, a, a sunny San Jose. Uh, I have my Seattle's best coffee uh, here, which will fuel me as uh, travel plans caught me out a little yesterday. So I had very little sleep. So uh, I got here late last night and all they could offer me for dinner was a, a bowl of rainbow colored honey nut Cheerios, which are the little, little sort of donut, extremely sugary and very brightly covered things. And then I got up for breakfast this morning and discovered that all they had for breakfast was rainbow honey nut Cheerios. So I'm highly caffeinated and highly sugared up. So uh, let's see how this goes. So today we're going to talk about um, sharing in social leadership. And we're going to take a tour through that. Um, those of you who have uh, come across the social leadership handbook uh, and my work around social leadership will be uh, familiar with the structure and I'll revisit that in a minute. Um, today I'm actually going to be sharing uh, quite a lot of new work. So just want to position that up front. I usually start with a, a warning slide. Uh, this, is, uh, so this is a working out loud session. I'm not just going to read you the chapter from the book. Um, in fact, I think we're only using one or two illustrations from the book in this. The rest of the work is, is new because I like to continue to iterate and um, develop uh, the work as we go. So I've said it's kind of co-creative and reflective. Uh, if I know I've got a few Twitter friends on the uh, on the uh, group here today, so you'll recognise some of the illustrations which will come out of the, the book, which is going to be out in about six weeks, which is um, called Social Leadership, My First 100 Days. So it's the practitioner's guide that goes alongside the handbook. So we're going to have a little bit of a tour through that. Now, we are just a, a, a nice small group today, so I can see the chat. Um, as we go so if you want to throw questions in as we go along or any comments then do and I'll um, be able to respond to them so um, this uh, might be familiar to some of you but I'll just quickly introduce that this is the model of social leadership which um, sits uh, at the heart of the, uh, the social leadership handbook and it's effectively I suppose um, both a uh, development pathway and a way of thinking about social leadership it starts on the left where it says curation and just to run us through it very quickly uh, curation is where a, a social leader chooses the space where are they going to base their <coughs> excuse me where are they going to base their um, leadership uh, how are they going to take a stance from there we go on to look at storytelling uh, how stories flow in the social age personal stories uh, co-created group stories and organizational stories and understand how stories flow through the system and how we can tell stories which are magnetic, which will be amplified, which are engaging, often less tidy than formal organizational stories, but deeply authentic. So we've run through those two sections already and I'll make sure we share afterwards um, a link back to the YouTube recordings of those uh, two sessions. Today we've arrived at sharing. So after we've taken our stance, and we've shaped our authentic, compelling stories. We think about, you know, how do we share? Are we just going to add noise to the system or are we going to add some signal into it? Uh, if we looked forward into the future, we'll look at communities, how communities work, how they're formed, uh, the role we take within them, the purpose that they serve, and how organizations can create an environment where communities can thrive. We'll look at reputation, which is really, earned off the back of the actions that we take and how reputation within our communities leads into social authority. Social authority being the counterpoint to formal authority. So formal authority is given to us by the organisation, social authority is earned by us within communities. With all of that in place, then we are able to start operating as social leaders. We're able to look at co-creation and the co-creative power of communities is their ability to make sense of stuff, to figure things out, often at speed. And increasingly, I'm working with organizations now who are finding that 
the co-creative power of communities um, can be radically fast. Uh, I, I was um, uh, talking to someone in one of the banks uh, a couple of weeks ago describing they have a, a sort of troubleshooting social community and the average time it has to get to a resolution of a, a, a challenge that's thrown in is two hours, which of course is far faster than most organizations can schedule a meeting. So co-creation is important. Social capital is the ability to survive and thrive in this space and to help others to do so, to ensure that nobody is left behind. And then with all of that in place, we can collaborate more effectively, both internally and externally. So we can help the organization to be better. But of course, the model is a circle because we, we continue to work our way around it. So um, here we are, uh, we're on webinar number five here, uh, looking at sharing in this series. So let's kick off our exploration of the social age. And I'm going to take us on to one of the uh, first slides, which is from the book. This is, this is the um, three areas that I split out originally most closely to, to look at sharing. So after we have, uh, you know, as we start to develop our social leadership, we uh, need to think about how we share our stories. And the three aspects I focused on then were about ensuring that our stories are timely, that they're in the right channel, and that we set the context around them correctly. Now, I'm actually not going to go deep into these today. Um, I, I should uh, make the offer. I, if you don't have a copy of the book and you'd like one, just do ping me a note afterwards and I'll happily um, get one uh, sent out to you. But th those are the three areas that we uh, go into most in the book. Today, we're going to take a, a tour through some new areas. Um, and these are going to be quite light touches, but I, I just wanted to position this. We're going to think about the impact between social capital and sharing. So uh, effectively, this is um, a thought I'm having at the moment, which is about, uh, is everybody equally able to have their voice heard? One of the real challenges we face is that as we are more connected, as the social system becomes empowered, um, certain people are left behind, not because of what might be the obvious factors, such as lack of technology, um, but more for social factors, embedded inequality, uh, especially in global organizations, which can operate across multiple territories, multiple different ethical, legal, and moral frameworks. In some territories, for example, women's voices will be heard more loudly or will be um, effectively heard less powerfully simply because of cultural factors. Um, we can find organizations where um, dominant uh, power bases that operate up in the leadership level can drown out other voices. So we're gonna just think a little bit about social capital. I want to think about the jigsaw of the organization. So, you know, how much of our ability to be effective comes down to what I myself know and how much comes down to the strength and breadth and quality of the community around me and what's the impact of, uh, should, what impact does sharing have within that? Then uh, some more obvious things, you know, generosity. Is sharing an act of generosity or is it one of reciprocity? Um, what will incentivize people to share? Um, how much is it transactional? How much is it relationship based? We'll touch, as I say, on inequality itself. Can people be disempowered, disenfranchised, uh, unable to share or unable to reap the benefits of a community that is sharing? Um, we'll think about, you know, just sharing time. So what do we share? Well, we can share our time with other people that can be valuable. We can share our resources. We can share our expertise. And then I want to think a little bit about sharing uncertainty. So in changing times, um, sharing our vulnerability and our uncertainty can be valuable. And then thinking specifically about surplus, I'm quite interested in how by becoming more socially dynamic and connected, organizations can effectively um, become better able to connect surplus to projects so they can be more efficient with what they have. So um, let's just sort of start with social capital. And this is about the, the conditions in which sharing can occur. So um, this is one of the illustrations from the, the new uh, book. And it's really about, um, you know, sharing. I don't, I was just sort of thinking about, you know, what is sharing about? It's often, um, there's often a transactional nature to it or a, a sort of, 
gift-based nature to it. We have the sense that I have something and I will give it to you. Um, and as with all of these subjective types of notions, I started thinking about, well, what is, where does the value come from? Um, is the value just from us giving stuff out? So if I constantly give you stuff, will that somehow make our community stronger? Uh, will it make our connection stronger? Will it make you trust me more? Um, and the answer to that is almost certainly not. Um, it's not simply the, the act of giving or the act of consumption um, which adds value into the equation. There's something more than that. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come up with a slide saying what the answer is. <laughs> this is, uh, I said at the front, this is a, a reflective session, thinking about, you know, where is the value within the community? That there has to be some Im imbued value or extraneous value, which goes beyond the actual um, artifact itself. Uh, and that's quite an interesting notion. Um, artifacts have sort of physical measurable properties. Um, whilst the value uh, that an artifact has may go well beyond that which is measurable. So by being generous or by being kind, um, we add some kind of possibly, I don't want to say unquantifiable, um, but difficult to quantify measure into the system. So if we look around us, we can see that certain communities are extremely high functioning. They're extremely good at coming together, at getting stuff done, at supporting each other, at challenging each other, at engaging in debate rather than outright argument. Other communities are, of course, entirely dysfunctional. So they tend to be hotbeds of animosity uh, or they tend to be very low energy, very low activity. So um, I think we have to get down to these kind of foundational pieces. Uh, as, as an organization, as we talk about developing um, our social collaborative culture, as we talk about sharing and generosity, we have to think what approach are we taking? Are we just giving people you know, some content to consume? Are we just giving them the, the sugary uh, honey nut Cheerios and hoping that eating lots of the Cheerios is gonna make everybody happy? Um, or are we doing something more than that? I think that, um, if we think about the socially dynamic organization, and you'll hear me using that term, if you, if you um, have read in my wider work, you'll see that I'm using that to refer to an adapted and evolved organization, which has a greater power than simply its formal strength. It doesn't just have assets and infrastructure and process and systems. It has communities which are founded upon high levels of trust, high levels of support. So I suspect um, that that those communities will be doing more than sharing the sugary snacks. Uh, so something about, about that. And David's just saying, um, is the value in any artifact whether you can, um, I've slightly cropped out the edge of the question. I think it says probably do something with it, make it actionable. I think, um, I, I, I'm sort of tempted, David, to say not necessarily. I think very often um, it is. So often if we're sharing something, we believe that it should be actionable. It should certainly be relevant and timely as, as we saw in that slide earlier. I think that that sort of line of thought is where I started with this. If something is in the right context, if it's relevant, if it's timely, if it's useful, then, then hence it's valuable. But I think there's this second layer of sharing, which is about cohesion within the community. So it may not be tangible. It may not be, if you like, um, directly actionable. Uh, it may be something about um, gifting uh, trust almost. Uh, if you're e interested in this, um, the Landscape of Trust is a research project that um, we're doing this year. It will be the largest research project on trust in the world in 2017. The prototype study last year had 5,000 participants. Um, uh, and this year we'll go much further with it. And it's looking to measure, to understand how trust flows through systems. So uh, trust between individuals is one type of trust. Trust within communities and groups and teams is, is another aspect we're exploring. Trust into the organization itself and also then trust in technology. So those are the four components 
Um, one of the really interesting things is that trust tends to sit in strong social ties, or at least that's my reading of the preliminary research, uh, by which I mean 65% uh, of people say they have some or high trust in peers and colleagues, people that they have shared experience with. So they will have, um, you know, they will be interacting with each other. They will, if you like, be gifting or putting something into that relationship with each other every day. 50% um, trust their line manager. About 35% trust people that set strategy in the organization. And it falls down to about 20% who uh, have trust in the chief exec or senior leadership team. Now, the interesting thing about that is it shows a clear falling off of trust or the perception of trust um, as it, things move further away from the immediate, the people that we have that, that shared experience with. But then there's an interesting second effect. If, um, if the executive leader is seen as a social hero, so if they're seen as authentic and socially engaged, the level of trust can ramp back up to 65% uh, again. Now, what that makes me think is that, it, that there's something going on. They're certainly not, um, they're not directly contributing to that person who thinks that. You know, there is no um, relationship in a, in a traditional sense, I guess, or at least there's no two-way relationship. Um, and yet they are finding value in it. They're saying they trust it quite significantly more, you know, 45% more. So it's a long-winded way of answering your, your question, David. Apologies for that. I think there are two things going on. I think there's one type of sharing, which is direct and actionable. And then there's another type of thing that flows through the system, which is around cohesion. So perhaps we'll, we'll explore that a little further as we go through. Um, if I just relate this back to leadership, I think uh, this, this ties into the purpose of uh, social leaders. And you'll see, again, if you've been following uh, the work recently, that I've really started splitting this out to say that we, we're not looking to take the formal system of an organization and make it better. We do want to make the formal system better, but in parallel to that, we're building a social system. So we have these two things, formal leaders with formal hierarchy within the formal system, social leaders with social authority within the social system. And we maintain a dynamic tension between the two. That notion of dynamic tension is important. If the formal system colonizes the social space, it just collapses it to be formal. And if the social system um, subverts the formal space, then it just becomes great fun, but chaotic and unable to achieve action at scale. So we're trying to balance those two things. Within that context and within the context of sharing, I think that the role of the social leader is to create the space for um, that type of collaboration to occur. So it's about enabling people. Um, if we're thinking beyond the straight gift economy, so <clears throat> if, if success was simply a case of saying, find three things every day and share them in a social channel, that would be easy. But of course, it's not that. If we all started sharing three things a day and we did so for three months, at the end, we'd just have a space that was cluttered up with a load of stuff and wouldn't really have added a great deal of value. So it's more than this. I'm sort of, you can probably tell, I'm really sort of thinking about, you know, what is the nature of sharing? It's, it's something far beyond that, that simple gift notion. So social leaders, I think, have to um, you know, enable this to happen, ensure that everybody uh, has the opportunity to explore this space, support people in doing so. Um, I put some negotiating in here because I think there's an important part of community formation. Um, I was in, in Seattle yesterday with one of the, um, the, the, the big uh, tech companies. We were talking about this, about communities their challenge is to um, create more effective learning communities. And they're very much focused on the learning um, word in that, uh, in that challenge. But, but I was really saying to them, you've also got to think about the community itself. Uh, communities are not just a, a collection of people. Um, and they're certainly not a gang, because if you, if you interview uh, people within gangs, you discover that they have formal hierarchies and power structures. Um, exactly the same as, as you know any accounting company 
uh, they, they might, uh, you know, they might not wear suits and ties, but the social structures underneath it tend to be very similar. So um, we have to kind of create the space for communities and we have to nurture and support some of the key behaviours of high functioning communities. So I kind of wanted to capture this, this key phrase um, beyond what they do themselves in terms of sharing to add value. Social leaders have to create the space uh, for that collaboration to occur. In. So it relates back to that notion of social capital, helping people to survive and thrive. So again, just to sort of reiterate and, and bear in mind, I said this is a reflective session. If somebody new is joining the company, if you're dealing with new starters and new inductees, you can't simply say to them, you know, share things um, to become uh, better respected, have higher social authority, be able to collaborate more. It's nonsense, you know, it will get you nowhere at all. There's a whole load of underlying um, softer stuff beyond that. Uh, I realize softer stuff is not a very scientific term, but it's, it's really back to that point of David's question. It's not just a case of um, artifacts and purpose. It's a case of trust, uh, reputation. And you know why is this important? This, this um, piece is actually from a different body of work. This is from the work around change, which I'll, I'll publish in a, a quite major publication in the summer um, around change and the socially dynamic organisation. So it's about how do we, excuse me, how do we uh, get the organisation to be more deeply connected? And it really talks about how a socially dynamic organisation will hear two very clear views of the future state. It will have the organisational view, but it will also uh, listen to and cater for the individual view. It will be a co-created and co-owned vision of the future. It won't simply be the organisation saying, this is where we're heading. It will, it will take into account those other views. Now, to hear those views, to hear those stories, we need to have created the environment in which they can share. One of the, the things I'm saying uh, quite often these days to organisations is that much of what we talk about, um, social learning, social leadership, innovation, these are not things that you can mitigate for directly. They emerge if we create the conditions for their success. So, you know, social learning, you can spend as much money as you like on platforms, on technologies, on, on managerial development, you know, you can do all this stuff but it doesn't mean you'll get social learning. If you create the conditions wherein learning communities can thrive, if you nurture and support them correctly, and if you carefully scaffold and design the experience as well, then you may find that people are learning in a social collaborative way. Um, similarly, I think with uh, an organization's ability to change, to adapt, uh, most formal change programs fail because they take this sort of top-down, pushed-out organizational view if we create the conditions in which every voice can be heard, in which individuals can find agency to do things themselves within a structure, within a frame, but with individual empowerment, then we're more likely to be, to be successful. So, you know, what's the, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the prize at the, the end of this? Well, the prize, um, you may recognize this uh, if you're on the last webinar, this was one of the um, illustrations from the new book, which I, I quite, um, uh, I sort of had a bit of fun drawing and I quite, quite enjoy, and I, I've shared it now probably half a dozen times uh, in, in work I've been doing. And uh, I hope it gets the point across that within organizations, stories are often used that, you know, as weapons, we, we sort of do battle with them. So the organization fires its view of the world at us and, you know, individuals fire their view back again, or, you know, some of these are sort of hidden behind the scenes, but oh, stories are the mechanism by which knowledge, information, change flows through the organization. So um, we have to think about how those stories are shared and how they're shared between these two systems. These are the two uh, systems I was talking about earlier, the formal system of the organization and the social system. Uh, and this, this dynamic uh, friction that we have between the two. So when we're thinking about sharing, we, we have to think, you know, think about these three pieces. Uh, I showed you a variant of this slide earlier. How relevant is the story? Um, what's the context in which we're sharing it? And how timely 
is that sharing? And I've been thinking about this um, more recently, uh, and I don't have a slide for this yet, so this is kind of um, earlier stage thinking. Um, I've been working on a learning architecture, which is uh, a framework to help organizations uh, be reflective about the type of learning organization that they are. Um, and within that, uh, I tend to ask is, are we looking for adherence and compliance, or are we looking for um, capability and um, individ individual capability? And so the, the reason that I, if I just sort of get into that a bit, very often organizations focus too strongly on consistency, scalability, and compliance within a framework. So learning in the organization ends up being something that we do to people to get them to comply with our view of the world. When we talk about social learning, we're usually looking for more of a co-created story and we're looking for people's ability to be effective at the end of it. Now to be effective, you may be uh, not simply complying within a set way of doing things, you may be exploring a space, building your own language and vocabulary within that space. So they're slightly different things. If, um, you know, if you're asking someone to fix a car, you can give them steps one to 10 to fix the car and measure their ability to remember those 10 steps and carry out those 10 steps in that order. Or you can teach them how engines work so that they're perfectly capable of figuring out their own way of fixing the problem. They have a broader and more devolved capability. And of course, they may not have it all themselves. It may sit within their community. And that's effectively the difference between a, a, a constrained formal organization and a socially dynamic organization. In a constrained formal organization, somebody will be employed to know the 10 steps to how to fix the car. In a socially dynamic organization, lots of people will have loads of different knowledge and experience of how to, how to fix a car. We'll just have created this space in which they're able to share that knowledge into the system. And to be clear, both of those organizations or both of those um, expressions of the organization are actually the same organization. It's just in one, the social voices, the ability to share and connect is silenced by the application of formal power. So it, um, organizations often believe that they have to somehow work really hard to get people to engage, to get people to share, to be generous, but they don't. They just have to stop doing all the stuff that prevents people from sharing and being engaged. I hope that made some sense. Let's um, just, just think about uh, sharing uncertainty, um, or, or possibly, you know, I, I could have um, said sharing vulnerability almost. This is, um, an interesting notion, and again, this is the this is the first time I've presented um, these thoughts. So, forgive this this session being more reflective than usual. Um, you may have seen me say before, you know, humility is at the heart of of social leadership, and part of that humility is um, the ability uh, to be, if you like, publicly uncertain. So to say. Um, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I actually heard a nice uh, story yesterday um, from the, uh, a very senior exec in, in one of these big uh, tech companies where he had presented at a, a town hall meeting to, to something like 60,000 people in the organization uh, to say, I only know what day one looks like. I don't know what day two looks like. And, and he uses, um, he regularly uses this notion of days to talk about how the organization is today and the organization it will be tomorrow. Now, when you have high formal authority, it's easy to share uncertainty. So it's easy for him to say, um, you know, oh, I don't know what tomorrow looks like, but I know that we have to focus on day one, we have to focus on now, and we have to continually reinvent ourselves to be relevant. But that ability to share uncertainty is probably held quite closely with formal authority. So one of the um, banks I'm working with at the moment has uh, a small prototype running 
of a sense-making problem-solving community. Uh, there are about 60 people in it, and the organization has about 60,000 people in it. But this community has been very successful. This is the one I mentioned earlier, which is able to um, problem solve, resolve issues in around two hours. That's the average time to resolution. One of the things I'm exploring with them is to what extent that ability sits in the fact that most of the people in that community carry high social authority, uh, uh, sorry, carry high formal power. So most of those people are some way up the hierarchy. And I think that's significant because their formal authority gives them uh, effectively an implicit ability to be wrong. This isn't there every day. They're not employed to do this job. They're in this problem solving community. So it's an experiment. It's been running for about three months. It took it about three months to become that successful. Um, but the sphere of consequence they operate within is really quite broad. As in, there is no formal mechanism of consequence for what they do in that space. So if they don't solve the problem, you know, they don't get fired. They don't get told off because it's a, it's, it's a new space. They're still doing their day job. So the, the, the bank is sort of understandably and justifiably quite happy with what it's achieved. But I still don't think it's becoming socially dynamic because the people in the community almost exclusively have this high social authority. Part of the reason I think why they are unable at the moment to scale it, they're struggling to scale it, and, and this to me is, is part of the challenge. People who have lower formal authority tend to have a greater consequence around being wrong. And you'll know that this sort of phrase, which is often used in organizations, it's all right to, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. You know, we pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, we learn from them. If you actually analyze um, the reaction of organizational cultures to failure, it tends to fall into three categories. You tend to have cultures where it's unacceptable to fail. So they're, you know, they're pretty harsh, they're pretty judgmental. Um, but they certainly exist. Um, you then have cultures where there's no consequence whatsoever, and they, uh, I'm generalizing, but they tend to be, uh, they tend to struggle to be high functioning because with a complete lack of consequence of failure, um, it's sometimes hard to gain momentum. The interesting notion is that many of the organizations that talk about it being okay to fail operate what I call execution cultures. So it's perfectly okay to fail, it's perfectly okay to fail, it's perfectly okay to fail, and then you suddenly fail at something that they think is important and they kill you dead. You know, they, 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 they don't operate a, a smooth gradient of failure. Um, they're in fact, they're inconsistent in the application of consequence. So I think we have to actively consider, uh, in fact, one of the tools I'm prototyping at the moment is called that, it's called the gradient of consequence. And in this context, I'm using it um, to plan learning journeys across quite long periods of time and actively trying to map out the consequence at each level. So this notion of, you know, how willing are we to share uncertainty? What we often see is that people are more willing to share it in social contexts if they're high functioning social communities than they are in formal contexts. So let me give you an example of, of that. Um, in running a, a leadership development program with uh, one of the uh, global petrochemical companies, um, what I discovered was that uh, some of those leaders started having what could be called offline conversations with the facilitators, sharing quite significant concerns. Now, bear in mind that these, uh, these are leaders within a business and the facilitators aren't even employed in the business. They are, you know, they're more junior, they're, but they're outside the formal hierarchy. And some of those stories were quite powerful. They were stories, um, certainly uh, two women shared stories about um, s strong aspects of inequality, one of them being told that she wouldn't get a promotion um, because, uh, because she was a woman, effectively. That's what she was, she was told outright. Now, she felt able to share that story in the social community, but she had felt unable to make a complaint in the formal system because of the high consequence of being seen as somebody that was, um, you know, in her view, it would have a consequence if she had shared that story. So I'm quite interested in this. I think socially dynamic organizations have a far greater willingness to, to share uncertainty. 
um, sharing expertise is uh, important and in, in social communities it's about you know offering help and support helping other people to to be effective but of course a key part of being able to share those those helping hands is going to be understanding um, how those communities function this uh, uh, the reason I've brought this slide up is is because I've been quite interested um, working with the National Health Service in the UK about change, about the degree to which it tends to get stuck in one of these branches. And, and these branches represent effectively high functioning but localised communities. So if you're working with a group of nurses, they tend to be highly connected to another group of nurses. If you're working with a group of junior doctors, they're highly connected to a group of junior doctors. So the expertise, the viewpoints, all tend to flow within these systems. Um, there's a couple of effects which you may have come across here. One is about confirmation bias, which is um, within closed communities, um, we tend to reinforce our view of what we believe is right already. Um, and we also tend to um, geolocate the problems elsewhere. So you, you'll often find in these organizations, they're typically big, they're typically complex, that their inability to change isn't felt at the local level. If you talk to people within these communities, they're often uh, you know, very effective, very curious, really want to do stuff differently. But they almost always say, well, it's those other people that will stop us getting that stuff done. Now, when we think about um, sharing, when we think about sharing expertise, um, this is one way that um, we may be able to help the organization become more dynamic if we actively orchestrate opportunities for these communities to cross-pollinate, if you like, to share expertise from one community into what may be seen to be an unrelated one. Um, because it, it comes down to that notion, again, of creating the spaces for collaboration to occur. Um, very often these sub-communities are separated by um, not just a lack of trust, but an active force of mistrust. Um, so if we're able to find ways to build the stronger social connections through sharing, and, and not that transactional sharing of, of sweet and sugary cakes, but this meaningful type of sharing, then perhaps that's one way we can help the organization to become more tightly bonded uh, in, that social, in that social structure. Um, sharing of resources is interesting and uh, as I found myself thinking about this on, on the plane a couple of days ago um, I was thinking about well it's easy to share again sort of within the communities we know it's easy to um, know the easy places to share but how do we know uh, the places that we um, that we don't know people who would benefit from our expertise um, but who simply don't even know who we are or what we do and so one of the notions I've, I've tried to uh, pursue in the new book is, is this notion of sharing networks effectively sharing contacts so bearing in mind we tend to operate in these separate communities what if we shared introductions to other people and again this comes down to trying to build out these webs of uh, social ties to, uh, across the organization. Um, the, the effects of confirmation bias are quite predictable. So uh, in a large organization of 60,000 people, um, any individual will consistently um, overestimate the number of other people they know. So our, our social networks tend to actually be quite small and tight, but we tend to consistently think that they are larger. So we say, oh, so you know, I know the HR team, I know the people in the the APAC team, I know, the, you know, I know these other people, but we only actually know a small number of them. So actively sharing connections, helping the organisation to become more um, networked, and finding meaningful ways to do that um, is quite valuable uh, to build the uh, social connectivity of the organisation altogether. And, and again, I'll relate it back to trust. If we can share. Um, vulnerability if we can share resources and expertise and if we can share our communities themselves we stand a chance of uh, actively practically um, building that connectivity within the organization sharing time is uh, of course a, an interesting notion we're we're all busy of course 
um, but as a, a, in, in aggregate, as a community, as an organization, there tends to be um, uh, far more disparity in how much time, if you like, we're using um, on any uh, particular moment. So this is one of the themes I'm following in the Social Leadership First 100 Days book, is how can you share your time? Um, so almost viewing time as a, as a gift. So uh, earlier on, I've been saying, we're not looking at the gift economy of sharing, but of course, in parallel to that, we do need to consider the gift economy of sharing. So uh, as well as trying to build trust within networks, when we think about what we have that we could share as we are developing our, our, our pathway to become a better social leader, sharing time can be very valuable to say to someone, you know, I have 15 minutes, can I do something for you? I have 30 minutes, would you like to talk something over? We can use that time for reflection, for challenge, for co-creation. We can, so we can use it for specific purposeful tasks. Or one interesting thing we can use it for is reflection. And what is interesting is I, I regularly find that when you create, if you ask people what they lack, what they want most of all, what they want is time for reflection, but they're too busy. So the thing they say they want is time. But then when you actually give them time, you typically find they fall into operational task-based things. They, they use that time to decide what task they're going to do next. They don't actually use it for reflection. So the thing we want is reflection. The barrier we believe we have to that is time. But when we're given time, we tend not to reflect. And that's quite interesting. And it, it sort of seems to me that there's an opportunity there for social leaders. If we are able to share our time and to help people to reflect, then you know, that may help to build our reputation um, our reputation in helping people to be more effective and of course reputation leads there into into social authority so that's one of the the, the themes that i'm exploring there um sharing surplus actually i don't actually have a slide for this one yet it's quite unusual i don't i can't actually remember off the top of my head if i've ever presented a, an idea which i didn't have an illustration for yet I was going to do one on the plane last night, but uh, it was uh, as I mentioned, it was a super long day yesterday, so I was uh, I was too tired to draw it. So there's my apology. I'm sharing my vulnerability. Um, sharing surplus is uh, important. I think it's actually I go so far as to say this is one of the great untapped areas um, for organisations to explore how they can um, link up surplus between teams between different organisations. I won't dwell on this today, as we don't have a as we don't have a uh, slide but sort of watch this space for surplus I, I think that organizations with strong social leadership highly engaged communities will be better able to join up the slivers of spare time resource of thinking that they have around the organization and the interesting thing about surplus is that it's what gave us wikipedia you know the most powerful potent force uh, space for co-created knowledge in the world today really um, and that came through the cognitive surplus of billions and billions of hours of, of spare time and thinking that people have. So surplus is, is really quite significant. Um, when we're talking, I, I mentioned this right at the start, when we are um, talking about sharing within social leadership, we need to understand who is disempowered and disenfranchised, who is left voiceless in the system and why are they left voiceless? Um, so the obvious reasons for that will be about access to technology, but we've touched on some of those other reasons. And, and one of the stories I found quite, um, uh, quite powerful in this is working with one organization. It's a mentoring organization for women in developing economies. And I've been involved with them for five years. Uh, and in that time, only twice, but twice was enough. I've been in a situation where I've, had to be interviewed by the husband of a woman on the program so that the husband can decide whether the woman is allowed to um, be in a coaching relationship with me. So is she allowed to meet me online in order to help her to be more effective in building a business? Now that's interesting because of course by my Western liberal values, um, that is surprising. You know, I, I was not something I would expect to come across. But of course, I, I recognize in a global context that we are separated by these uh, differentiated 
uh, views, um, a different strength in our voices. So people can be left voiceless for all those kind of reasons. They can be left voiceless because they experience a high sense of consequence. They can be left voiceless because they lack trust or they have high levels of mistrust. Um, they can be left voiceless because the culture of the organization is too fragmented. Um, I'm not going to go into it today, but it's some very interesting work looking at the coherence of culture in organizations and the um, risks of fragmented cultures, and they're quite significant. It's not that... Um, it's not that having a few people left voiceless is going to cripple an organization in the everyday reality. The challenge is that we can't become truly socially dynamic if not all the voices can be heard. If we just focus on people who get it, who are loud, who are noisy in this space, it's a subset of the entire community. One key role of social leaders, uh, and in the, the, the model you may remember it right at the end, is social capital the ability to help people to survive and thrive in this space and to thrive is a key part of it. So when we're thinking about sharing, we have to think about uh, who is left voiceless. How can we help these people to find a, to find a space? I, I've sort of left some of the predictable ones, if you like, to the end. Generosity, you know, is, um, is sharing about generosity? I mean, you, you, it depends. If you take a transactional view of it, so, you know, if I share something, we'll somehow become a, a tighter, more socially cohesive group. Then you could, you could argue it's an act of selfishness. You know, I'm kind of, I'm sharing not to help you succeed, but to help myself to have a stronger connection to the community. And, you know, I don't know if I'm feeling reflective, maybe, maybe, those, um, maybe those are flip sides of the, the same coin. I normally say that social leaders share, they share, without any expectation of reciprocity. I think that's probably the key notion here. So they're not, it's not that they're giving away money, they're giving away time, resources, energy, connections, and they're doing so in aggregate. So we invest as social leaders in our community. We share into our community, not because of a transactional relationship with any one individual, but rather in aggregate, because we believe if we build a reputation within that community based upon sharing, then that community as a whole will be able to um, support us when the time comes. So in that sense, I guess you could argue it is selfish, uh, perhaps, in perhaps any action uh, into a community is selfish, but it's also... Um, it's a gen it's about generosity. So our sharing is is not really transactional in the moment, but it is in an expectation that if we invest in our community, the community will invest in us. In fact, that's probably one of the measures of a high functioning social community is that it, when we need it, it, it rallies around. So generosity is important, but really more about these notions of generosity with our time, with our resource, with our energy. Helping others to succeed is the is the notion of generosity and social leadership and simple things you know saying thank you is very important um, it, you know it, not in a, a sort of inauthentic um, scripted way but um, saying thank you to people sits um, in the social leadership work around curation choosing your space and setting the rules that you will operate by um, so it's very easy when we're busy for some of these quite socially cohesive factors to, to fall by the wayside. So we can take quite simple steps of offering thanks, um, of sharing our thanks with people to help us to, to come together more strongly. So if we just sort of wrap up by thinking about this, this jigsaw of pieces, you know, what's the picture that we're looking for when we, when we, talk, about, um, when we talk about sharing? in social leadership what would it look like for us individually and within the the organization well um I, i've settled on this slide to to talk around this this comes from further around the model about reputation and the cautionary message of this slide is that reputation isn't based uh, just on the words that we use it's based on the actions that we take so um, social leaders are authentic through their actions. They don't just say the right thing, they do the right thing. And um, 
I think this is true of, of sharing. So the jigsaw is about the actions that we take, the ways that we shape our stories, the ways that we share them, the ways that we share our time, our energy, our resources, uh, our communities. Um, in that sense, sharing uh, sits at the heart of social leadership, um, not a transactional one, but an investment, a view of sharing where we invest in our communities. So that kind of takes us uh, to the end of the, uh, that, that sort of uh, slightly rambling, slightly reflective narrative through sharing. Um, the next webinar uh, will be about community in social leadership. So it will, it will take us into looking at where our communities are, the role that we take within them, the purpose that they serve, the hidden and the visible uh, types of community. Um, but I think that we've got a few minutes left if anybody has any questions that they would like to, to throw in or any comments. I'll just give up the contact details as we, uh, as we do that. So uh, just to remind you, if you don't have a copy of the Social Leadership book, do drop me a note and I'll happily get one sent out to you. Yeah. Hello, thank you. Thanks for that, Julian. That was really interesting. Um, I could see you thinking as you were going along there, but um, it's a really nice way of doing it, I think, sometimes. It sort of keeps uh, all the content very alive and in present uh, in your mind. Um, so if we do have any comments on the chat, then just let me know. There's about uh, two or three minutes before we do a bit of wrap up. Um, just from my own point of view, actually, just one thing I wanted to raise with you. Um, I guess the challenge of um, sharing is also um, promoting it as a habit and a culture and removing some of that hardness in working cultures that get ingrained through people just striving for results all the time. Turning it into more of a sort of generous space, as you say. Uh, what I've got a lot from, from your content is that it's, it's, it's moving your own world into somebody else's world and having a kind of blending uh, creates a sharing culture. If you had one or two sort of silver, simple, um, simple silver bullet ideas into how that ball can start rolling within an organization, what might they be? Well, I think the, um, the key challenge that I see is um, I fundamentally disagree with some of the notions of hard and soft skills, hard and soft measures. Um, I might just ask Paul if you could just mute for a second just while I uh, answer getting a bit of feedback. Thank you. Um, effectively, uh, we still hold on to the notion that all, uh, that sort of formal leadership is a hard measure and social is kind of soft and nice to have. Um, the reason I challenge that is I think that um, strong social connectivity and high trust are, if you like, the new harder measures. So um, in, in terms of what we can do about it, that, that, I mean, that is, uh, forgive the obvious setup, that's very much the subject of the next book, practically how do we do something about it. The first tip is really um, lead from the front, engage in change. So uh, as social leaders, we have to step forward and we have to do the thing and we have to inspire other people to do the thing. So being generous with our expertise, with our communities, with our ideas is clearly a, a first part of it. The second silver bullet, if there is such a thing, is um, about recognizing, uh, respecting uh, and socially rewarding the people that do engage. And this is a key challenge for organizations to face. They are used to measuring informal spaces and rewarding formal performance. And now they need to learn how to recognize social strengths the people who bring high values, the cohesion of the community, and how to reward those people who don't want formal reward. In the trust research, it shows very clearly that people who contribute to the um, cohesion of a community, people who are the strong social leaders and storytellers, don't want financial reward. They want opportunity, they want legacy, they want the ability to engage ever further. So uh, those would probably be the, the two things I'd suggest. Great, sort of new forms of currency really to a lot, to a lot of people. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any further uh, questions to add on the chat. Uh, just to repeat what Julian said, our next webinar, which is on April the 18th, is on community. And that's followed up by one on reputation on May the 30th. So one in a couple of weeks and then a month and a half to the, to the following one. Um, so I'd just like to thank you all for coming. I uh, appreciate your attendance. Um, we're going to be putting this up on YouTube along with all the other ones. So you can go along and see all the Sea Salt uh, videos there. And thanks to Julian for his time today.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Have a great week.